Welcome to Project Brewpeg, the story of a couple of crazy Kiwis who bought a big old steel trawler, started converting it into a global expedition and research boat. Last couple of weeks, you saw us make a pretty cool little bracket for our water tank. Trev, cut that out, mate. We made some sparkles. I did a stern look. Jess made some wood. And then she sanded it. We had some laughs. Both of us. And then we trim some more steel. This week we finish up the desk that's going into the studio for our second Mac and we get our water tank installed into the engine room. This is a, is a shitty ply. <laughs> what is it? It's like B or C or? No, that's the technical name, shitty ply. <laughs> shitty ply. <laughs> C grade. C grade? C, or C and D grade. It's structural ply, but one side's D, one side's C. Yeah, so um, structural ply, it's, like it's, it's, it's not great. You know, you get sort of knots and they sometimes put putty in holes and things like that. But um, it's like 50 bucks compared to what we would need A, ply, um, a grade. Um, that's like 175. It's just a bit more work, you've got to be a bit more patient and it, it sort of cracks a bit easier than A grade, I've noticed, um, when, you're, when you're cutting, but as long as you're careful and you take your time, it's well worth it. There's um, some things that really help when you're doing this kind of work, and that is uh, don't stand angry <laughs> and don't stand tired. When you're doing the finishing work, like you're trying to get this real smoothness out of something that's not supposed to be smooth. It's, um, you know, when it's cut, it's not smooth. It, it takes a lot of patience and uh, it really pays off to have a good feed. Otherwise, you just sort of, you end up hating it, you know, and you don't do a good job. The other thing I really love is uh, not using gloves when I'm sanding. It's because I like to feel, so you're feeling the ridges with your fingers. You need that sensitivity to catch them. Um, and then just using the, using the sandpaper, um, almost like a sculpture. Uh, tool. Does it fit? Do. It's a wee bit sloppy, but we can put some packing in that. Or we can do that. That's better. Right. Well done. So, so you want to pull towards you. Okay, you don't want to go away. You always want to angle it and then pull it towards you. Mm -hmm. And this is called a lift up. So you, you start it on the metal. Start on the metal, press the button, and then lift off, and it'll arc. Okay, so here we go. Wow, it's smelly. What happened there? The wind blew the gas away, and see it nuked the tip. Yeah. So see how my little circles are creating that? So all, all I'm doing is small circles like that. Okay. And that's all you need to do, and you'll end up with a perfect arc. Okay. And there's no splatter, there's no anything. But if I try and do it with that tip, it'll turn to absolute custard right now. So you will, you'll sharpen it. When the wind doesn't blow it away, and you're careful with the tip, you don't touch the work. Yeah. You can get. You can get like metres and metres and metres before you have to touch your tip. Right. Like, so maybe you know. we should do it out of the wind. So remember you want to hold it on and then press the button Just and lift off. Just and do it that way so I can yep. see what you're doing. So you hold it on like that, press the button, lift off, circles. That's your sequence. Ah. Hold up. Ah. You've got to have your angle back towards you. That's it. So press and then lift off. Yeah. That's it. That was, that was good, but you touched the tip and obviously stuck. Yeah. Right, 
just give it a grind up. So you might find it easier to hold it like that, because then you've got kind of rest on your arms. Sort of That's good, yep. So come forward more. Come forward. Yeah, creep forward. That's it. Okay, just uh, turn it off and we'll have a look at the world. Woo awesome. <laughs> Bloody awesome. The only issue, Woo the only issue is leave your torch on longer so the gas flows over it. But that's perfect. Look at look at how, look at how clear it is. Wow. It's nice, eh? Oh, it's beautiful. This hair's sticking in a bit. Like undercut in there. Yeah. That's probably just because you started and maybe didn't move it fast enough. No, it okay. might have just dug a divot. Because every time you're blasting, you're basically melting metal and pushing it away from the flame. It's so very that, different from this. I can feel the the metal. I can feel the uh, the flow. On the mag or two. Yeah. On me, I can't feel the... Yeah, because theoretically you're not touching anything. Yeah, so, yeah. it's quite hard that way. Yeah. yeah. So, so, keep, keep so you, you've gone from about there to there, I think. Yeah. See how your weld's slightly wide? So, oh, see how it's a bit of flaky shit? Yeah. That's because you didn't um, hold it on there and the gas came way too early. So that's, that's... You haven't got porosity, though. Like, you've obviously had enough gas, but not quite enough to stop that oxidation on the surface. But that's okay. And also, have a look down here. See that blue, how it dives down like that? You're a bit hot. Like, see how I've, I obviously move. Oh, this higher up or? No, nah, move faster. Okay. You, you're moving too slow. And that's why your weld's bigger. Okay. Like, you got, yeah. Um, I just got to clean the tip up. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's like it's probably weld. Move faster. Bit too fast. That's it. You can also see it, can you? Yep, yep, 100%. Okay, Luke. Remember to keep your gas on when you lift off. That's really good. Look how tight that is. What do you mean you keep your gas on? So, so when you, you, you finish your weld, and hold it there, don't touch the work, but just hold it there with your finger off and the gas will run for two or oh, three seconds. Because okay, right. no, it yeah, shields it while it cools down. Right, okay. um, so look at your heat down oh. here, see how it's much more even? Yeah. You've got a straight line compared to your big bowl. Yeah. You, you're at the right speed. So you can get it tighter by moving a bit faster. Now your gun is sort of like that, whereas if you aimed it like that, you'd get, you'd get more like that. Okay, do it a couple turns, give it a hit. And then chuck it in the drill. It did really good though. That's bloody awesome. For first TIG wells, that's awesome. That's that's like fucking ten times better than my first TIG. Good feature. See, like all you're after is uniform pattern. Like once you've got your molten puddle, you just want to do the uniform pattern to keep it molten and keep pushing it forward. It's not that hard. No, it's not complex. Do you want do you want to carry on? And yeah, I'll get the rest. Rest. Yeah, I'll get them finished. It won't take you long, will it? No. no. Do you want me to hold this for you so you can keep the breeze off? really tight and it's because the fitment was real close yeah some of them are much like to fill a big gap so you end up with sort of rough <laughs> j-dog massive oh. <laughs> <laughs> jesus here it's fucking awful <laughs> so like that one there see that there the yeah. fitment was really good so you can just yeah, go it's beautiful. the whole way around it's fast it's kind of like a fan isn't it yeah. You do it well, a good yeah. One. Yeah. Because yeah, because you're kind of blowing the metal. Yeah, yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Let that cool down, and then uh, once that's cool, we'll throw it on the top, and we can start doing the plate. This is Jess shit stirring. <laughs> As always. Start to see it's getting cloudy. It's getting clearer and clearer. 
It's putting thunder into straight epoxy. So it basically means it soaks into the grain or the wood better. You get a better seal. Something like Evijur or like West System, some of the West System products, they're really thin, they're almost like water, and they soak into the wood amazingly well. This is a cheap version of it. Dame got on with some plumbing for the water tank. Moment of truth. So, water on brew peg comes up through this pipe, through that ball valve, so we can shut the water off really easily. Goes through two filters, one after the other, as we've discussed. Right, there's two pipes here. The white one going down, that's the cold water feed for the boat. So that supplies basically every tap in the boat with filtered water down to one micron. This temporary garden hose is our feed that goes through all the way along the roof. Da -da -da, along the rib and down to the bottom of the tank down here and that's the cold water feed into the tank again filtered down to one micron this is not drinking water either so that's why I've used the garden hose until I can um, replace it with drinking water pipe right I did manage to get enough drinking water pipe to do the return though so the hot water is coming through this white pipe that leaves the top of the tank follows exactly the same path all the way along through, got to finish that bit. Comes along through here, joins onto this blue pipe, which used to be our old hot water feed, and then goes up into the um, main cabin. So, our water filters are gonna be mounted here, right beside the door going into the engine room, and that allows us like really easy access. I'm gonna build a little stainless bracket for them, so they're super simple to turn on and off, and also change the filters. And I'll have a little cupboard beside them that has a bunch of filters in, so it's going to be really easy from a maintenance point of view to keep that uh, in great condition. However, the test, let's turn the water on. I can hear shit happening. It's stopped happening, which is probably a good sign. Still, still happening, bubbles. Let's dump a bit of air out of the system maybe. Okay, that's not necessarily air. Gurgle, gurgle. Gurgle, gurgle. Alright then, I think we'll call that a win. Alright, technical time. by however wide we want. And that pipe is 42. Lovely. Our bracket rises from the cardboard. Right, that's the shape. We'll cut that out and we'll weld it in. One of the commercial boats coming out. Be interesting to see what that boat's like. With my body, um, my tissues tear, like my muscles and my lungs and things, if I, if I use my body too much, like a normal person. But I, I realised the other day, I don't know how to use needles and things more often, it works so good.
Jess and I had to do a bit of a emergency dash to the um, to the ER last night. Well, when I say ER, it's more the I fix your phone repair shop type thing in town. We had um, external microphones on our cameras, and uh, we've got three of them, and we've killed three of them in the space of maybe three weeks. <laughs> So one of them really took a hard hit on the roof of the boat. It fell over and absolutely smashed on the roof, destroyed the mount that has it, the internals. Something happened inside the, the thing. Just There was a lot of uh, audio complaints on the channel. That was what was going on. The mic just absolutely destroyed itself. So we thought, okay, sweet, we have to get a new one. That one's dead. So we got a new one and put it on the uh, camera and everything. Probably had it running a day. It was a good little mic. It was nice. Um, Wynn got it yesterday, smashed it on the ground. So there's another one down. They're not cheap, they're like 220 bucks each. Um, and that's the cheap end of the good ones. So anyway, raced into town, took all of our dead mics in there and said, okay, can you make as many good ones as you can out of this box of parts? Uh, so yeah, we'll see how we go. We'll find out this morning if we actually have mics or if we have to buy another one. This morning's job, we're pressing on. This is our bracket series of bolts, a couple of a bit to steel. So this bit here is getting welded onto the lid and this bit here is becoming a bolt-on piece. I tried welding that directly to the the steel but I couldn't get the lid on and off the tank so um, I'm making it a bolt on bolt off bracket so this morning's job get this thing tacked on to the lid and start um, welding it up. Up until this point we've been using TIG for most of this but we're going to be using MIG now um, the reason being is TIG is great for like little fiddly bits and um, you know delicate work that sort of thing where you need a lot of control it's quite slow and also I'm not very good at um, doing right angle joins with TIG yet um, I haven't, still haven't got my technique down and, and that sort of thing so I'm not going to risk it um, MIG, I want to run three beads. I'm going to do stitch welding, I'm not going to continuous weld, but I'm going to do three beads in each, at each end of that bracket, so it's going to be a pretty robust little bracket. I'm just going to use this countersink drill bit to take the edges off these drill holes. Uh, it just means the paint holds better and you don't have to deal with it with your fingers, any sharp edges. Right, two bits of steel, ready to sandblast. That was good. It's just turned dark o'clock, so um, yeah, pack up for the night. But I'm pleased that I got that blasted today. It means that I can let it rust overnight. I know people will freak out at that word, but we actually want the rust to happen on this steel, on, on all of our steel when we do this wet blasting. Because when we rust kill, it bonds to the rust, so it actually gets a tighter bond into the metal. Um, there's going to be some people out there that are probably going to have a problem with that. And yep. Dry blasting is probably the best way of doing it um, and then putting a, a, a real solid zinc rich epoxy onto it. But if you don't have the ability to dry blast, wet blasting is the next best thing because nothing else has got enough key to actually hold the paint. Wet blasting roughs up the surface enough so you get a real good bond. That's why we do it, because it's about $3 a square metre for us to sandblast at doing it ourselves with a wet blaster versus about $35 if we were to pay people to do it. 
Um, and we have to move the boat if we pay anybody to do it because we're not allowed to blast out in the open if it's dry blasting. So these beams here are 60 mil battens that we've epoxied and we glue them into the walls on Brewpeg. We use 60 mil battens because that's the thickness of our insulation. By putting these guys in, we're able to just put panels of uh, polystyrene insulation in against the wall. It goes nice and tight against the steelwork and then we can put a wall panel straight over top. Um, it's a real simple and easy way for us to join all of our interior. When we glue these to the steelwork, we use Fixtech 190. Um, it's a structural adhesive, it's an awesome product. Um, so we actually don't get paid by these guys, they send us bits and pieces like this every now and again when we need them. Um, but we've used this for years, and we use it because it's a really good price, but it's the technical support we get from them is bloody awesome. So if we ever need to know what product to use for what um, reason, that's why we use these guys. They've got amazing support and they know their stuff. Um, they're Australian too. Aren't they? Yeah, they're Aussie. They're down the Gold Coast, I think. Um, because they make the product, they understand what it can and can't do. So they give you really, really accurate technical advice. That's the reason why we choose these guys. So um, we'll glue these in and then we'll start getting some um, interior done so we can get this bench in. So in Jess's studio, aptly named the Think Tank, by our lovely friend Karen, this is where her normal desk sits. And if I spin around, you've got uh, an area where we're putting a second desk um, for our second Mac. Now, we've put in uh, these wood um, 60 mil battens. They, that's essentially what we're screwing our wall panels to when we uh, fit the insulation and then screw the panels to them themselves. Now, I have made a little bit of a balls up. When I put them in, I have to sandblast this area here and paint it, and I forgot all about it and put this over top of it. Um, Jess came up with a great idea, which is going to nip a piece out. We'll sandblast in behind it and then epoxy the whole lot so the, the wood and the steel will be epoxied at one go. Now, one thing we do have to do down in this corner. About three, four years ago, we replaced this. We put in a piece of stainless. It used to have mild steel pipe that went into the water tank and it was rusted out and gross. We changed that for stainless, then sandblasted out the tanks and got them painted. One thing we didn't do was sandblast in this area and replace this rib. We didn't see it at the time, but what's going on is basically this is a box section rib and it's uh, when the boat went underwater, that rib fell, uh, filled up with water and all of the silt, sand, rubbish went to the bottom and has rusted it out. It's really common with box section um, uprights like that if a boat goes underwater that that's a risk. If you've got, say, there you go, you see the rib on the hull, it's just flat, mild steel plate completely different scenario if you've got a closed box like that. They do fill up with water and they do rust out from the bottom. Now, thankfully, we've only got two or three of them in total in the entire boat that we have to deal with. This being one, the other two being just that way in the kitchen. So in a couple of weeks when we start ripping the kitchen apart to sandblast it and fit the new uh, cabinetry and so on, we're gonna replace the ribs that are uh, rusted out in that room. Um, instead of replacing them with box, I'm probably just gonna use six mil by 50 mil flat bar welded in the place where, where the old rib used to be. Um, that's pretty much how they're building boats these days using flat bar as opposed to box. There's way less uh, inherent rust issues with flat bar, much easier to maintain over time, um, and no downsides. It's just as good as using the, the box section. This box section is a uh, 2.4 millimeters thick wall, um, so by using a piece of 50 by six, you've got the same amount of steel holding the structure up. Just really awesome height. So there's some things to do. We've still got to drop this other table a bit, this yeah. desk, and we're going to paint it with the same paint because it's just it's so resilient that paint and it's a really beautiful paint this year. Yeah. We have to have Mish's little pore still showing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. And then we'll do it with the storage and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. 
quite a spacious uh, office, really. Yeah. And this will be used for um, research groups and uh, crew and, you know, all our projects. This will be sort of the, as Karen put it, the think tank. There'll be comfy seating for three people, like, so three of these seats will fit in here. So two over there, one here. Um, and there'll be shelving and stuff for gear and whatnot. So there'll be plenty of computer space and work beam space and everything on the boat. Time to stick this bracket on the top. All right, that bit done. Let's drill some holes. We need more than hopes and wishes for us to make it through the night. Stormy weather, weary eyes. Hope to make it through the night. For this night is over. I've just drilled holes in steel, so theoretically that'll rust. There's two options, paint it. I'm not gonna do that, because it's gonna take ages to dry, but also I don't actually need to. So the only way rust happens is if you've got oxygen. So a couple of tricks. When you put the bolts on, you're gonna seal up that space. It's gonna become a tight space, but there's always the chance that there's a pinhole and new oxygen can get in there and it can rust. So put a bit of copper coat, smear it around. As you squeeze all the bolts together and everything, it kind of goes out and fills up all those gaps. Um, also helps in being able to open that bolt later on, 10 years down the track when you need to undo it. So, especially because I'm doing stainless bolts, we all love galling. If you haven't experienced galling on stainless, get a couple of, um, get a stainless nut and bolt and tighten the crap out of it. See if you can undo it easily. Stainless loves to bind up on itself. Right, come loose from there, my mum. You just try it. I bet you will. All right, tanks in. Had to modify the plan a wee bit. Um, couldn't fit the rubber in. Doesn't matter. Tank's tight. It's not going to move. Um, it's going to be pretty interesting to sort of see what that thing does in the seaway. The brackets are definitely strong enough to hold it, but it'll be curious to see how that tank actually holds up. Doesn't really matter. As I said, always, it's a temporary tank. We're going to build a stainless one. Just not right now. We'll probably do that in maybe six months, nine months, something like that. 